Welcome to the Northeastern IPM Center, Firelight IPM using non-antibiotic control methods on this uh, full afternoon. I hope you are doing well and that this is going to be a really interesting presentation. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, three wonderful researchers with us to share findings from, from that project. So um, a recording of this webinar will be available within a week at that link here. And also anyone who's registered for this webinar will get a copy of the uh, recording when it's available. So um, if you uh, don't get a chance to listen all the way to the end, I'll send you an email with, um, with the link going forward. Um, and we ask that you use the Q&A feature rather than the chat if you have a question. So let me show you how to do that. Um, if you scroll over your screen, you'll see a, a, um, a menu bar that comes either at the top of your screen or at the bottom. And there's um, something in the middle that says Q&A and there's like a little file folder there. If you click that, you can ask a question and um, you can ask it anonymously. There's an option where you can just check the box and um, it will have it be anonymous for you. Uh, we ask you to use that feature rather than the chat feature because it's easier for us to keep track of the questions. And uh, we already have 43 people uh, on, the, on the line and uh, we have quite a lot of people registered for this. So um, it's easier for us to keep track. Um, and uh, please uh, ask questions at any time and we'll be taking some breaks along the way so that, um, so that we can answer your questions. Um, so uh, I should introduce myself. I'm Jana Hexter. I work at the Northeastern IPM Center and it's my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And we also have with us Quan Zeng, who is an agricultural scientist with the Connecticut Agricultural Research Experiment Station. Uh, Dan Cooley, who is professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Neil Schultz, the agricultural uh, scientist at Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And uh, we're delighted to have all three of them here today. And uh, on the agenda today, on the next slide, we will see that. There we go. Uh, there's a general introduction to Fire Blight, um, an overview of control strategies, um, some non-antibiotic trial results and considerations and recommendations to be thinking of um, if you are uh, considering these options and then plenty of time for questions. But before we dive into the agenda, we are going to ask you some questions and um, Kevin in the background, there we go. So you'll see, you should see a poll come up on your screen and uh, there's a few questions here. And if you could answer those, there is no right answer, there's no wrong answer. It just gives us an idea of who is here and, um, and your level of interest and experience uh, before we go in. And uh, we're going to give you about three minutes uh, to answer these questions. And so I'll just be quiet while that happens. You have to answer all of the questions before they submit. You can't really skip one. Um, but please don't be concerned. Uh, you just take your best guess. And if you've just joined us, uh, please feel free to participate in the poll that you see on your screen. Um, there are no right or wrong answers. It's just uh, information for us. And um, you can submit it uh, once you've answered each of the questions. And uh, there'll be a time, another minute, 
uh, while we're just uh, going to give people time to read through and answer the polls. Great, we'll just give it 30 seconds more and then we'll uh, show the results of the poll. And if you're just joining us, please feel free to answer the poll questions that you see on the screen. Wonderful. So um, I'm going to end the poll and Kevin, if you can show us the results, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, so you can see here, um, most people are not using streptomycin or it's not applicable, probably researchers or extension agents. Um, and the vast majority of people are very interested or extremely interested in this topic. Um, the biggest concern for people is streptomycin resistance and, um, and the uh, biggest concern about using an alternative method is uh, that it would be less effective than streptomycin and the second is that um, they have a lot, you have a lack of knowledge about good alternatives. So hopefully this uh, presentation will help uh, give you some more information so you can make good choices. And um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Quan Zeng. And Quan, you're going to have to take yourself off mute uh, just so folks can hear you. And we'll begin the presentation. No? Terrific. We can hear you. You can hear me? OK, great. great. Uh, thank you, Yana and the Northeastern IPM Center for giving us this opportunity that we can um, share our results and also I hope this webinar would provide a platform not only for us to share our results but also I know many of you guys are researchers or extension agents in the same area and we all have a passion to in uh, providing you know helping the growers to provide some good alternatives for disease control I hope this can be a platform of uh, uh, communication and interaction and uh, uh, knowledge sharing. So, um, so first uh, I would like to give a brief introduction of fire blight uh, for some of the uh, folks that are not familiar with this disease. Fire blight is a disease of plant, uh, is a disease occurring on rosaceous plants. In addition to uh, our most familiar hosts such as apple and pear, it also can occur on uh, many other wild hosts and also landscape plants such as quince, loquat, plum, crab apple, Indian hawthorn, rose, mountain ash, serviceberry, and some small fruits such as raspberry and blackberry. Um, many of um, and the causal agent of this disease is the bacterial pathogen Avenia Avenia amylovora. And the uh, infected tissues often appear as uh, blackened or browning colored, uh, which quickly wilt, uh, shrivel, and dried. Um, two characteristic symptoms that are often used for diagnosis are shepherd's crook and woods droplets. So uh, here are some, some of the pictures uh, showing uh, disease symptoms on a variety of uh, uh, host plants. Uh, some of those uh, wild host and landscape plants uh, can also serve as a source of inoculum and also pathways for the pathogens to transmit between orchards. Um, fire blight is an old disease that could be dated back to the late 1700s. However, the occurrence of fire blight in recent years has uh, seems to increase and the damage seems to be more uh, severe. 
And this, for a large part, is uh, could be due to the uh, uh, the fact that we adopted the high density orchard planting system. Um, uh, the high density planting uh, obviously uh, significantly significantly increased our uh, efficiency in fruit production and also improved the fruit quality. But but at the same time, it also increases uh, the risk of fire blight um, for a number of reasons. Number one is that the the per acre value of a high density orchard is much higher than a traditional orchard. Um, in the high density setting, more than 1,000 trees are densely packed in an acre of land, which compared to about 200 to 300 trees per acre in a traditional planting. And if you uh, consider one tree would cost you usually about 15 bucks, uh, just for trees alone, um, an acre of uh, high density orchard would easily cost you up to 20K, uh, which is about four times higher than the traditional planting. Um, secondly, the distance from the shoot tip um, to the central cent leader is much shorter on a dwarfing tree than on a traditional tree, uh, which means um, it is much easier for the pathogen of Winnie amylovora to get into the central leader from the initial infection, site of infection. And for dwarf trees, the tolerance of fire blight uh, infection is quite low because once you, the central leader is infected, a tree uh, is pretty much dead and has to be removed. And the dwarfing trees uh, can start producing at a much earlier stage than traditional trees. Often at uh, uh, three year old uh, trees can start producing. Um, so in order to uh, drive the central leader uh, to the top wire, uh, in a trellis system, the growers often adopt uh, a high density, uh, uh, sorry, a high nitrogen fertilization program so the, uh, so the central leader can reach the top fire by year two or year three. Um, which uh, this high nitrogen fertilization also is known to increase, to increase host uh, susceptibility to fire blight. And finally, many dwarfing rootstocks, such as the famous M9, M26, or Bud9, are either uh, highly susceptible or susceptible to fire blight. In addition to this high density orchard uh, adoption, uh, another factor that may also um, make it more challenging to manage fire blight is the climate, climate change, which increases the ambient temperature during bloom and also um, over the summer month. Um, as we all know that the pathogen grows at a much higher uh, rate, uh, at a higher temperature than the lower temperature. So that also increases the chance of fire blight infection. So how can we develop an effective management program against fire blight? Um, in plant pathology, we all know that in order to have a plant disease to occur, uh, three components need to be fulfilled at the same time. A susceptible host, a virulent pathogen, and, a, and an environment that is favorable to the infection to occur. So one strategy that we can uh, limit the disease occurrence is to reduce the host susceptibility by growing less susceptible apple varieties or uh, use fire blight resistant rootstocks as much as possible. We can apply systemic acquired resistant inducers, SAR inducers, to boost the host Im immunity. We can use some of the growth regulators such as Apogee um, to um, limit the vegetative shoot growth. And those are all helpful to reduce the susceptibility. And finally, uh, try to avoid over fertilizing your trees to make the, those uh, um, would, would also be helpful to reduce host susceptibility. Uh, the most commonly used strategy to limit disease is to uh, target the pathogens. Uh, the pathogens can be uh, killed on plant surface 
by spraying antibiotics or other um, organic or non-organic um, uh, bactericides and uh, biological controls. Um, or they can be removed um, by pruning when the pathogens are internally present in the shoots and branches. Some researchers also have uh, tried using uh, virulence inhibitors to suppress virulence, uh, pathogens virulence and use that as a strategy to, to uh, limit the disease occurrence. Um, currently, it is, those strategies are under field trials and, uh, and already show some promising results. And another way we can, uh, another way we can, um, another way is that we can use disease prediction models to time the strep applications to when the environment is the most favorable towards infection. So where are the pathogens uh, in the cycle of disease? Uh, during the dormant season, the pathogen cells are mostly uh, within the canker tissue, thus can be removed from pruning. And during the early spring, uh, pathogen cells start to emerge to the plant surface and can be, thus can be targeted by uh, antimicrobial sprays such as copper or oxidate. Um, during bloom, the pathogens grows epiphytically on the flower surface, thus can be targeted by antibiotic, uh, biological controls, or other products through uh, spring. And blossom blight um, represent a timing when the pathogens, uh, the epiphytically present pathogens are internalized into the host. And uh, from then until the rest of the growing season, the pathogen cells are predominantly present in the xylem and the parenchyma uh, tissue that can mostly be removed through pruning. However, some cells may submerge, emerge to the plant surface as ooze, so they can be targeted by copper or oxidate. However, uh, copper and oxidate application may cause uh, phytotoxicity and rusting, um, so need to be used in caution. Um, to me, there are three situations that could use a copper spray after bloom, which are when you maybe when you have a tons of shoot blight or overwhelmingly have a whole lot of shoot blight in your orchard, and the goal is to salvage trees instead of producing fruits, or when you um, are you can use copper on on young trees that are younger than three years old, then you are not expecting them to produce any fruits. Or you can use that on some, um, um, some processing apples that rusting is not an issue. So managing fire blight is really a, a year-round uh, um, uh, year uh, strategy, uh, starting from uh, winter and early spring, uh, prune off the cankers, and use copper to sterilize canker surface until bloom when we use uh, antibiotics, bactericides, SER inducers, and, and biological controls to control the pathogen growth and fire, uh, blossom blight infection. And uh, after petal fall, uh, research has shown that uh, uh, the prohexadiene calcium, which is the apogee, uh, can be very useful to limit shoot growth and reduce host susceptibility. And uh, when, uh, when you see the infected shoots in the summer, just prune them off and let them dry or, or burn them. Uh, recently, uh, there are some researchers showing that um, um, once you have, uh, have a tons of fire, uh, fire blight, shoot blight infection, you can uh, sometimes use the ActiGuard paint paint a concentrated formulation of ActiGuard on the, on the removed canker, uh, which can uh, help to prevent canker from reoccurring, or you can spray apogee um, or um, to uh, 
even you have true blood already, maybe the cankers of later, later on, the canker formation can be reduced. And uh, in this uh, project, we are fo mostly focusing on the, the, the blossom blight management, which is to try to see are there other products other than antibiotics can be very useful to control blossom blight. So why do we need um, more than streptomycin? Streptomycin seems like it's working great and uh, very uh, not expensive either. So uh, number one is uh, motivation is that the streptomycin resistance has emerged and um, it is spreading. And uh, so far it has reached uh, or have been observed in um, most of the apple producing regions in our country, including the Pacific Northwest, the Western U United States, and uh, in Michigan, and recently in New York. So uh, in 2015 to 2016, we performed a streptomycin resistance survey in the New England region, and uh, we actually did, did not find any resistance in our, in our part of the country, which is the good news. However, however, we want to keep the situation this way. Um, using other non-antibiotic strategies will be great in managing antibiotic resistance. The second motivation is that for our organic growers who uh, cannot use uh, any, any, any antibiotics after October 2014, so uh, what can we uh, tell them? How can they uh, grow apple organically? Uh, especially in the Eastern United States, um, things are very challenging. And uh, so this would be a good uh, option for those growers as well. So I think um, we are trying to break the presentation into two parts. So this is the first part before I move into the field trials. So uh, are any people, do you have any questions or input or comments? Yeah, I can see uh, there are, Actually, one is a comment, um, and uh, I'll read that first from Stephen Bibular, Orchard Ridge Farm in Maine. He said he fled organic, but he's looking for a good tank mix and effective alternatives to streptomycin. So he's in the right place. And, um, and then, um, and actually, um, so he said Apogee has aggressive root retention effects and is recommended at the very time you want to apply PGR thinners. Will you present research results on effective Apogee usage in alternation with PGR thinning agents so that fire blight is suppressed and one chemistry doesn't counteract the other? Um, do, uh, uh, does Neil and Dan have any comments? <laughs> I would say that we're, we're, we didn't get into the Apogee piece. Um, so that question is still out there. Uh, I, the, the focus on what we were looking at were uh, materials that would be acceptable in organic production systems and uh, would, would give us some decent control. So Apogee, uh, I think that there are con concerns of uh, Apogee can uh, especially on young trees, if you use apogee, you are going to slow down the, the vegetative growth. It's uh, less desirable. Um, but, um, but I think the decision has to be made uh, based on, um, for example, the, the history of your orchard. You do you have fire blight in the past and how desperate you are and uh, what, how susceptible your varieties are um, so maybe if you are really uh, struggling with fire blight in your orchard and also you are happen to be a very susceptible variety, you know, then, um, then perhaps Apogee is a good option. And uh, trials in, uh, by uh, um, uh, Kerry Cox uh, and uh, uh, George Sunday and many other researchers have shown that um, early application of uh, Apogee uh, um, can be very effective in uh, limiting the shoot blight stage of infection. Um, however, uh, like, a, like a, I also think that uh, blossom blight uh, management is uh, also critical. 
So it, to me, if you already manage a blossom blight, um, you don't really have uh, a whole lot, won't have a whole lot, whole lot of uh, shoot blight uh, to, uh, to, to begin with in theory. So that's why we, in this project, we are only focusing on the blossom blight stage of infection. Thank you. We have one other question, but I think we'll save that for uh, the next Q&A period so we can keep to our timeline. So Zhang, if you'd like to, or Kwan, if you'd like to, uh, to carry on, that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, so in, in our project, we are uh, uh, working on the non-antibiotic materials. So uh, there are uh, mainly two categories of such materials. One is the so-called non-antibiotic bactericides uh, that are um, uh, including copper, contact sterilant, uh, lime sulfur, or the potassi potassium uh, um, aluminum uh, sulfate. Um, for coppers, uh, traditionally fixed coppers are uh, more used in tree fruit disease management. Uh, however, in recent years, um, um, there are some of the newer soluble coppers, such as uh, Quiva, uh, copper soap, and, um, and the Previsto. Those uh, chemicals um, are using a, a reduced metallic copper content, thus has a, a lesser chance to cause phytotoxicity to the trees. Uh, for contact sterilants, the most popular ones are the oxidate, 2.0 uh, by BioSafe, or uh, sometimes you can, there's a new version, the Oxidate uh, Tree and Vine, and they're also available. Uh, many biological controls um, with the active ingredients, uh, including bacteria, viruses, and yeasts, are also available for controlling fire blight. So here we are really trying to uh, answer two questions. One is that uh, what product would work the best um, in the Northeast under our uh, soil and uh, weather conditions? And the second, uh, are we able to further enhance the efficacy by combining uh, those two categories of materials that I just mentioned? So it is important before I go move on, I, it's important also to understand that those two categories of material actually have different uh, modes of action. The non-antibiotic bactericides can immediately suppress pathogen growth right, right away after application. However, the, for the biological control materials, especially for those bacteria and yeast the ingredient products, you often have to allow one or two days for the material to propagate on the flowers, so then you will have the antimicrobial effect. So our field trial is, uh, was set up on, or was performed on 25 year old apple trees, red delicious or golden smoothie. For each treatment, we included four reps and uh, assigned those reps in a complete randomized design. At the Lockwood farm, uh, of Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And in total, we tested four different biological control products. Uh, double nickel, which has a bacillus uh, bacteria as the active ingredient. Blightband A506, which is a pseudomonas fluorescence. Blossom Protect, which contains a yeast, actually two yeast strains. Blo uh, Bloom Time Biologicals, with the Pantoya agglomerans, a bacteria ingredient as the active ingredient. We also tested two um, uh, non-antibiotic bactericides, Cueva copper soap uh, and Oxidate, which is a hydrogen uh, dioxide um, formulated uh, contact sterilant. We compared those treatments, uh, fire blight, blossom, uh, blossom uh, blight uh, control effect uh, with the positive control, which is the firewall, the streptomycin standard, and the negative control, the, the water treated control. Um, so 
as I mentioned, the biological controls need uh, time to, to develop on flowers. So those, so those uh, materials were applied twice, once at 40% and then again at 70% of bloom. The organic chemicals, those bactericides, were uh, also applied twice, once at 100% bloom and then 24 hours uh, after. So the goal is to uh, use those biological control to occupy the flowers first and then um, use the organic chemicals or bactericides to, to heat the bacteria one more time um, at the end of the bloom or, or right at the full bloom or at the end of the bloom to further reduce any, any bacteria that escaped from those biological controls. And we inoculated all the uh, trees with uh, uh, an artificial inoculation of Avonia amylovora at the concentration of 10 to the 6th CFU per ml at the 100% bloom. All applications were put down using a motor motorized uh, solo backpack sprayer. Uh, three weeks later, we went back to the uh, orchard and rated the disease uh, by counting the percentage of blighted flower clusters. And this is the uh, the results of the 2017 uh, field trial. Um, in 2017, uh, the disease pressure is pretty high. For the water treated control, um, about 60% of the flowers developed uh, uh, fire blight symptoms. Compared to that, um, uh, streptomycin treatment was able to uh, reduce that number down to about 20%. And a reduction in disease were observed on um, trees treated with uh, organic bactericide, uh, cueva and oxidate. However, the reduction is just uh, marginal. It's not very significant. Um, for the biological controls, bloom time and double nickel uh, did not provide a significant reduction in disease percentage. However, the Blossom Protect, the yeast product, uh, performed pretty well, especially when you use blo Blossom Protect together with Oxidate. It uh, provided a protection similar to the level of streptomycin did. We also observed that Quiva and the Oxidate has a very effective, uh, reduct uh, can effectively enhance the biological controls, uh, disease uh, control efficacy. Um, this is the case for Blossom Protect. When you see, when you use Quiva or Oxidate with Blossom Protect, the disease percentage is further dropped. A similar situation were also observed uh, for another biological control, the Blossom uh, uh, Bloom Time Biologicals. Oxidate seems to perform a little bit better than Cueva in this situation. In 2018, we really had a light year of disease in Connecticut. Um, so as you can see, the water treatment only had 32% of uh, the blighted flower clusters. And under such low disease pressure situation, almost all the biological control treatment um, provided a desirable protection against the fire blight. And Blossom Protect uh, exceptionally performed exceptionally well, and it, it even uh, showed a, a lower disease percentage compared to streptomycin. So in 2019, again, we had a, a not a pretty light year of uh, infection. And as we can see uh, here, um, Blossom Protect again uh, surpassed the streptomycin in reducing the Blossom Blight uh, infection. Uh, when we use the uh, Blossom Protect together with Oxidate, it pr provided similar level of uh, protection. So, uh, does it really mean that uh, the additional application of oxidate is maybe not necessary? 
or uh, can we just use Blossom Protect uh, by itself? Would that be sufficient? It would be sufficient for the situation in 2019, but in years with a higher disease uh, pressure, like this year in 2015, uh, we actually saw that um, Blossom Protect and Blossom Protect uh, with Oxidate, there is a, a pretty big difference, um, showing that this one, this additional applications of Oxidate is really going to be helpful in years with higher disease pressure to further drop down that, to further hit that bacteria hard again, uh, right before the infection would occur. To clean off those uh, uh, bacteria that escape from biological control. So, so far the biological controls or the organic control management uh, strategies works fairly pretty well. Are there gonna be situations that uh, they are not gonna be working so well? Uh, well, uh, in our field trial, we, we did observe the one year in uh, Massachusetts, uh, none of the bio, uh, biologicals or organic control method worked. Um, in 2017, um, uh, uh, Dan Cooley and his, uh, his crew uh, uh, performed the trial in 2017, but uh, the disease didn't take off. Uh, so in 2018, they uh, might have added a little bit more inoculum and uh, the disease pressure happened to be just perfect for the, the disease to uh, take off. So as you can see, uh, for the, uh, under such a high disease pressure, the, in the water treated control, uh, almost 100% of the flower clusters got fire blight. And even streptomycin uh, treatment couldn't rescue it. Uh, still about 40% of the flower clusters uh, got disease. And uh, under such a high disease pressure, none of the organic uh, treatment uh, practices provided any meaningful control uh, against fire blight. But still, uh, some of the uh, Blossom Protect uh, in combination with the uh, non-antibiotic um, bactericides, Cueva and Oxidate, still uh, performed relatively better than the other uh, organic uh, materials. So here is a summary of the performance of Blossom Protect and Blossom Protect plus Oxidate. Seems like those two, um, two uh, strategies works the best in our uh, uh, five years of trials. Uh, over here, those numbers represent um, the performance of those products equivalent to the percentage of control provided by streptomycin. Over the five years, the overall uh, uh, effectiveness of Blossom Protect when used alone is about 69% uh, strength uh, to the streptomycin strength. Um, when, you, when we use Blossom Protect together with Oxidate, um, that number is 92%, uh, which is uh, pretty, pretty nice. And if we remove this year of 2018 Massachusetts because the streptomycin didn't even work that, that great, uh, this number could be even uh, higher. So summary, uh, summary of the field observations, um, Blossom Protect provided pretty consistent and high level of protection against the Blossom Blight. Uh, second, the control effect of Blossom Protect can be further enhanced uh, by when used together with other organic bactericides such as oxidate and the uh, quiva. And other biological organic chemical products uh, can provide some level of control and can be useful when the disease pressure is low, but when, when a, a disease pressure is super high, it often uh, couldn't uh, uh, be sufficient. So here are some of our uh, rec recommended uh, uh, control protocol based on our observation. Um, during the uh, midterm to uh, put down uh, two applications of Blossom Protect and make sure you use Buffer Protect uh, in this situation because Buffer Protect is a 
like a, a, a citrate uh, uh, formulation of material that can drop down the pH to make it unfavorable to for the pathogens to grow. And uh, at a, a full bloom, uh, put down one application of 0.5% oxidate. Um, this will really clean off all the escaped bacteria from the biological control. And if you, if the disease pressure is high or if you have fire blight in your orchard in the past, uh, consider putting down another application of, uh, of uh, oxidate 24 hours after bloom. So we think the, the blossom protect is essential for this management protocol. Uh, whereas the oxidate application uh, applications uh, can subject to uh, adjustment based on the disease prediction models, depending on the whether you have a uh, light year of disease or or heavy year of disease, as we show that on light years, just blossom protect should be sufficient. But on the heavier year, you might need some further assistance of oxidate. So is this going to be a silver bullet of uh, firefly disease management? Well, there are a couple of limitations, uh, obviously. Everything has limitations. Uh, first of all is the, uh, the cost. Uh, currently, the, the uh, organic treatment uh, materials cost about uh, twice as much as strep. Uh, let alone, you know, there are other considerations such as uh, the labor and timing during bloom. You, you are very busy with scab control. Uh, thinning, you know, how can you find so many days of uh, application for for the organic? But you know, that's that's the one limitation. Um, even the cost is higher than strep, but it still be uh, considering the organic treatment can have the perspective of managing the antibiotic resistance. It still would be cheaper than when you have strep resistant in your orchard, and you have to rely on other alternative, such as consuming to, um, to manage fire blight, which is about uh, three times higher than strep. Um, another limitation is the, the risk of fruit rusting. When applied under humid conditions, blossom protect and oxidate have potential to cause phytotoxicity and rusting. Um, Sometimes the petal uh, turn a little bit brown colored and uh, occasionally you would have some of the fruits that are also rusted. However, the rate of rusting is usually below 5% in our trials. So, so it's not a, uh, it's marginal, it's not a big concern. So trying, try to apply the products under sunny dry days may help alleviate such risks. Uh, another big uh, limitation I didn't list here is, is the compatibility with the scab control. And uh, obviously in the Northeast, uh, many of your, your folks are uh, all know that scab is uh, really intense, uh, especially when we have a rapid shoot, uh, shoot growth and um, when a high percentage of those, uh, um, the, the scab uh, venturia inequalis uh, ascospores are mature and ready to be released. In the in the same rain rain event that will also trigger fire blight, um, the reason I'm saying is is not very compatible is because the uh, the the yeast strains used in the blossom protect is uh, very susceptible to many fungicides uh, used for scab or for other uh, management, especially those multi site uh, inhibitors. These are very susceptible, so so it's tricky to find. Uh, to coordinate the blossom protect application uh, together with uh, the scab management. So um, further research need to help resolve in this situation. But if you are uh, organic growers, you don't have this problem because you know, you obviously you don't use fungicide. So that's, uh, that's a, a good situation for at least for organic growers. Um, I have to mention that uh, these trials, uh, these trials in Connecticut is not, uh, we didn't even invent any of those. The, the, the similar trials has been done in other regions and uh, 
such as uh, in Michigan and in Oregon by uh, George Sundance group and, uh, and the Ken Johnson's group, they all have uh, proved that the Blossom Protect is very effective in those sites. And it uh, seems like recent years, the, I don't know if the, there are any uh, West Ridge people here, uh, the, the Blossom Protect uh, efficacy is, uh, seems to be uh, rising a little bit uh, based on our experience. And uh, not only in field trials, but also Blossom Protect commercially has also been used uh, a lot in Europe and in, in Pacific Northwest by, uh, through communication with uh, my colleagues in different places. So it is definitely a, a worthwhile um, product for, for you to consider, uh, especially for, for organic growers. So I think uh, this is the, today's presentation and uh, now we have a lot of time to, for further discussion of uh, questions, on their questions. Yes, there are questions. So uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Pete Nelson, I think you maybe answered this in part, but maybe not fully. He asked what rate was used for each product and the maximum label, uh, was it the maximum labeled rate? And what kind of adjuvants or conditioners we used? So we use the um, strap at, at the 100 ppm and the blossom protect um, used at the um, recommended uh, strength uh, as, as the label, uh, la label indicated. The oxidate we use the, um, in our trials, we use the 1% uh, and the 0.3%. Uh, so we found that if you use oxidate by itself, um, you can, um, uh, you should use a higher rate, like 1%, but if you use it in combination with biological controls, you can even use like 0.3% or 0.5%. That would work equally well. Okay. Great, thank you. And uh, must blossoms be open for these materials to be effective? For example, um, there is no point in applying strep if you, uh, um, if you were still at pink. Uh, I don't want to be the only person talking, so because I have two other colleagues, so I encourage <laughs> my colleagues to go ahead, Quan. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, strep is not gonna be able to penetrate into uh, unopened flowers. So, so yeah, don't apply it any any time uh, before uh, the flowers are are open. Great. Um, and then have you tried Blossom Protect and then Oxidate after infection? Well, he, this is Vincent Kwan. He's, he's asking, um, can you put on Oxidate once 24 hours after the infection? After the Blossom infection? Already after, infected? After, after we're getting, say, uh, um, Mary Blight or whatever. Oh, okay. An okay. Infection. Oh, oh, like an infection event. Yeah. Um, I, you know, for, for all the uh, uh, literature that I read and my personal experience is, uh, I, I believe the Blossom Protect uh, really need uh, one, at least one day to, um, to propagate. And the modes of action um, from the this year's uh, Fire Blight uh, Symposium workshop, uh, international in, in, in symposium, I learned from uh, um, the uh, Ken Johnson's lab is that it does not produce any antimicrobial stuff, but its most of action is most most likely to block the the flora cup, you know, under the the hypanthium area, the where the the ne nectaries, you know, the nectar thos. So if you block such area, seems like uh, you know bacteria can come in. So uh, so based on that limited knowledge, I think if you uh, have already had an infection p uh, event, and uh, let's assume the bacteria already went in through the uh, nectar thos into the uh, uh, ovary already, uh, then you apply uh, blossom protect 
since it is not documented to have any antimicrobial production and it's not documented to boost any host immunity. So thus, I would think it may not be uh, gonna be very effective um, as a rescue plan. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Stephen Bivula said, young plantings bloom over a wider time frame, and many of the newest scab resistant CVs do not bloom nicely together. I need a program that can be tank mixed with petal pool applications and subsequent cover sprays to deal with the presence of bloom throughout the spring and summer. That's more of a comment than a question, but. <laughs> Dan, you have any, or Neil, do you have any comments on, on that? Well, Stephen had asked earlier in, about whether you, and a couple of people said, can you tank mix things? Um, and my answer was that you couldn't put things like oxidate and strep in a tank mix with a bacterial-based um, biocontrol. Right. And you made the comment, I believe, that oreobacidium and fungicides don't work very well together. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't. I, don't, I think that the, that's a bit of a problem myself. Uh, trying to tank mix materials, um, at least antibiotics if that's what you're uh, talking about, Stephen, uh, whether tank mixing strep as a, um, to you to sort of uh, manage resistance. He's, he's got to type in a question again. <laughs> I can't talk to him. <laughs> uh, well, uh, while he's typing, I think, uh, I think another way I, I saw people are recommending is, uh, yes, it is truly a headache for those uh, young, younger trees uh, that can bloom into June or later, you know, which is uh, very difficult to control uh, fire blight. Uh, uh, however, if you try to uh, uh, plant those trees instead of in the spring, but in the, in the fall. Uh, people said uh, it tend to have like more or less uh, of a problem having this uh, uh, later bloom, you know, in the, into the summer. And also uh, many people recommend uh, hand remove those flowers from the young trees um, because, you know, you don't want the flower, like the hand, hand remove all the flowers. Um, but I know it's probably, uh, very um, labor uh, consuming, but it is another way you can, um, instead of putting down those chemicals all the time, but. Great. And Stephen said to comment that late bloom is a more difficult problem over regular bloom. So, which I think you were addressing. Yeah, so try to try to plant some trees in the, in the fall instead of in the, in the spring and, and see if, uh, uh, there will be a little bit less of those late bloom than you know in the, in the spring. Okay, so we have a couple more questions, and I think we're just going to run over a few minutes so we can answer them. Um, somebody asked, "What about using a saw product like LifeGuard prior to bloom or during bloom with Blossom Protect?" And Vincent said it didn't work in his trials, but I'm wondering if any of the three of you have some uh, feedback on that. So the question is, the, do, do SARs uh, work during bloom uh, or prior to bloom as well as Blossom Protect or with Blossom Protect? Yeah, what about using an SAR product like LifeGuard prior to bloom or during bloom with uh, Blossom Protect? So I don't know if Vincent is saying that, that he didn't, if he had that combination and it didn't work, or just that the SARs didn't work. I, I think that um, from what I've seen, the SARs generally are not as effective as Blossom Protect. Blossom Protect seems to be th the winner of the biologicals that are out there right now. And uh, I, th I heard uh, lots of research uh, by, uh, uh, I think, uh, Carrie Peter. She has been using uh, SAR inducers to uh, manage shoot blight and uh, seems to be working working well in Pennsylvania. Uh, but for blossom blight, I think uh, uh, number one is the, uh, the, the timing is kind of uh, fast and uh, you have to sort of apply that earlier. So in, in, to me, I feel like uh, SAR would be more effective uh, in, the, in controlling shoot blight than 
then it's much any use on the blossom plate. I think that's a good a good point, Quan. It takes I forget how long it takes to really get this systemic acquired resistance reaction going, but it's at least uh, forty eight hours and more than that in some cases, right? Yeah, I think uh, I think so. I think uh, you you need to give the plant some some time to induce uh, those those PR genes and and so so to me, I feel like SAR are, uh, can be applied uh, uh, later uh, after bloom uh, to uh, manage uh, shoot blight and also like just like uh, I mentioned in the presentation, Ken Johnson used the SAR inducers to paint the uh, the removed cankers to prevent the canker from forming, but he did that mostly on, on pears, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so we've got quite a few questions coming in, actually. So if uh, Neil or Dan or Kwan wants to answer any of them uh, in writing, we can do that too. So, um, uh, so I have a question here. Um, organic growers do typically use sulfur and or lime sulfur for scab. How can we integrate uh, these without killing off the blossom protect at, cr at rich critical fire blind times if possible. <laughs> I don't think you can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, uh, the, uh, Ken Johnson published some uh, uh, papers a couple of years ago about uh, he first uh, applied uh, lime sulfur and fish oil uh, as a sort of as a also like a thinning Thing. And and then and then blossom protect afterwards, um, but, but there are always gonna be issues of uh, you know maybe they're not compatible. Okay. All right, and then can quaver and double nickel be used at petal fall and uh, following cover sprays? I'll, I'll let you go with that. I'm typing corn. <laughs> okay. Neil, do you have any comments? You'll need to take yourself off mute, Neil. We didn't have much luck applying uh, double nickel with our systems. Um, so uh, I, you know, I, I really can't comment on that. So I think the, the uh, double nickel is a bacteria. After pedal fall, I don't think it's really going to uh, do too much uh, on the blossom blight uh, uh, management. Um, uh, it indeed uh, have uh, the flowers after petal fall indeed harbor lots of bacteria at the at the Hypanthium region. So maybe Quiva can, um, you know, maybe knock down the the knock down the pathogen population a little bit. But I haven't done any work. But so we didn't include that into the, uh, the this protocol. But uh, maybe uh, you know, maybe the, it will. But I, I I think the efficacy may not be that high. Okay. Um, so Thomas Shuk asks, do you have any comment on the use of Oxidate 2.0 for scab, and how can this be combined with use for fire blight? I I think Oxidate the timing would be too tough to uh, deal with on scab for the most part because it, it basically it just impacts the microbes that it comes in direct contact with on the plant surface and so the the process of scab infection is more prolonged than uh, than fire blight is so I think what would happen would be you you wouldn't get very, very good control. Most fungal diseases um, are tough to control with oxidate. Okay. All right, we have two more questions left. So one is, is it recommended to use both strep and uh, BP plus oxidate, perhaps using an application of strep and then wait a few days and then do the BP and oxidate? Um, I think the timing is, is everything. What you really want to do with Blossom Protect is, is coat the flower and allow it to grow prior to uh, Irwinia coming in contact and be able to grow. So if you have residual, um, you're just not going to get a double benefit by you know, knocking things down necessarily. Also, um, we're thinking of the Blossom Protect and, and the uh, Oxidate as a sort of a replacement with strep. 
the more you strip, the more resistance you're, you're potentially going to get. And if you're not really adding that much more benefit, you are still putting a selective pressure to get resistant bugs. Um, so I, I wouldn't suggest doing all of them at once or, or in the same year. Okay, great. And, um, and then last question is, uh, does Boston Protect tolerate sulfur? And Vincent said, uh, yes, it was compatible with the tank mix. Um, do you have a, guys have anything to add to that? Nope. Okay. All right. We got it. Okay. There's, there's two questions in the chat that I'll just read out. Uh, any use of oxidate once shoot blight is showing to slow down spread? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, um, uh, number one is you need to be careful of the rusting if you use it for shoot blight control. Like I said, um, it may, you, you may have rusted fruit if you, if you do anything after a petal fall. Um, but like when you are desperate, you know, when the, uh, you have tons of uh, shoot blight and you just don't have enough labor to remove them, uh, having some um, oxidate or copper spray between rows um, can e effectively uh, kill the ooze on the, on the surface. So it may uh, reduce the shoot blight um, uh, spread uh, between trees, not within trees. You're not gonna target any bacteria within those shoots, but between trees, uh, yes. Um, but uh, actually, I, I mean, I, based on the, the oxidate is toxic to, um, to uh, fire blight pathogen, I would think, but I actually I haven't done any field tests of, uh, for that thing specifically. Did you say scab fungicides interact with Blossom Protect? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, most of the fungicides, uh, especially those, uh, you know, the newer ones, are are very toxic to the to the yeast because yeast is uh, is a eukaryote. Fungi are, you know, they are all the same same family. So, so they are, you know, that that's one one li big limitation to me that. Um, if you are if you are a conventional grower, you know how do you time blossom protect and your fungicide at the same time? You need both at the same time to control both diseases. You know, how can you do that? Uh, well, I think um, you just hope uh, sunny days. <laughs> uh, next one is several years ago, a mix of coeva and double nickel was reported to have been effective control in mid Atlantic. Has any more work been done with this combination? Uh, I think, yeah, there, there, was, there was about two or three years that Keith Yoder primarily was doing work uh, with that combination. Um, and it works well. I think, though, that the work that Carrick Cox, if I were looking at shoot blight right now, I think that um, I would focus on uh, slowing down on growth in one way or another and using Actigard as a SAR promoter. So, and by slowing down growth using Apogee, some sort of prohexadione calcium to, to stop or slow shoot growth. That's That in combination with an SAR is probably gonna be the best. And then the last one says, slightly off topic, are there any sprays to reduce straggler bloom either to by making bloom more consolidated or just by burning off late bloom without causing phytotox on young fruit seems unlikely. I'm not aware of any of that. I think anything that, you know, like people use lime sulfur to take off early bloom sometimes, um, but lime sulfur is gonna russet fruit. That's just the way it is. And then the very last one is why not refer to the compatibility chart for Blossom Protect? That's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like a suggestion. <laughs> so great. Okay. And talking of suggestions, there are some comments in the questions uh, from Peter Wirtz and Stephen Bibular um, that people may want to uh, refer to. Um, and we will send a copy of the Q&A to people and a copy of the recording so people can go through those. And um, 
with that um oh thanks. sorry uh Nyana, i i forgot to mention one one more thing is, is that uh, uh the blossom protect uh, the uh, oxidate is uh, available to all states blossom protect is currently registered in in 10 states of the the us and many states are are actually still not registered i actually contacted the westbridge company and uh and requested them to uh, at least register for all the for all the new northeastern states. Uh, the, but uh, before that, you 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 need to be uh, uh, understand that uh, you know there there are limitations that you can still use it before the registration. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Quan, if you can uh, show the rest of the slides, that would be helpful. Okay. Oh yes. Um, and we're just going to ask you some of the same uh, polling question, with similar polling questions that we asked in the beginning. And Kevin, if you could pop that up, that would be wonderful. And uh, let's see, is it showing up? There we go. So, um, yep, you should see some questions. Um, I think there's four or five questions. And if you could just take a moment to answer those, that would be wonderful. And then I have a few more uh, goodies to uh, share with you at the end, and uh, then we'll close up. And just as before, there's no right and wrong answer. And also um, you need to uh, choose an answer for each one of the questions before it can be submitted. And we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. It really helps us in making the toolboxes uh, better for the future. Okay, we'll give it 15 more seconds and then we'll uh, share the results. Okay, so I will end the poll and share the results. There we go. So um, we have lots of people who are very interested in, uh, in uh, using this approach. Um, and um, after this webinar, there are more people who are concerned about the difficulty of managing this. <laughs> and uh, so this is good to address. And uh, this team offered to follow up with people on more information in implementing and uh, 30 of you were interested in that. So I'm sure that they will uh, follow up with you. So um, I just wanted to let you know that we have a couple of uh, things to announce. We have an RFA for uh, grants that is available right now, and the deadline for the grant applications is November 15th, and the link to that is there. We also have another toolbox coming up in November on ident um, identifying and prioritizing uh, range shifting for invasive plants. Um, um, and that's going to be a very interesting presentation in November 5th. And then we also have an online conference coming up at the end of this month. And uh, this is kind of a rapid fire five minute presentations from people throughout the Northeast. Um, actually, I think Quan, you're on the list of presenters. Yes. Um, just to give like short, sharp bullets about research. It's, it's fun, it's interesting and, um, and also recorded. So please feel free to register and we can send you a copy of the recording. And if you can take me to the next slide, that would be great. Uh, the Find a Colleague, um, if you are looking for people uh, such as Dan and Neil and uh, Quan to work with, 
um, please feel free to go to our Find a Colleague site uh, where you'll see people's profiles. And if you want to upload a profile for yourself, um, that you're looking for a collaborator in a certain aspect of IPM in the Northeast, you can uh, freely go ahead and upload a profile. And okay, and there, today's webinar will be posted on demand. You can watch it as often as you like. And um, it takes us about a week to edit it and uh, put it up there. So, um, and I will send you um, an email uh, once that is ready. And uh, finally, we would like to acknowledge our funders. And this would not happen uh, without our funders. Um, so the IPM Center is funded by the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, NIFA, in, um, and, um, and then also um, University of Massachusetts and the Connecticut Agricultural Experimentation State, um, Station, <laughs> sorry for mangling that, uh, fund uh, um, Neil and Dan and Kwan and their work. So, um, so I appreciate uh, all of you being present and the great questions and uh, the energy around this. I hope this is helpful and uh, you'll hear from me with a copy of the recording uh, when we have it ready uh, next week. And um, feel free to uh, follow up with any of the presenters and you will probably hear from them if you uh, signed up that you would like to be in contact as well. So enjoy the rest of your uh, Wednesday and uh, hope you enjoy this beautiful fall weather. Okay, all right, bye. Thank you, bye-bye.